Live from Boston, my name is Emilio Madrigal. Today is August 18, 2020, and I am joined remotely by my good friend and colleague, Rifat Manan, who is in Philadelphia. Today, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Alessandra Schmidt, and she's going to be doing a talk on frozen sections. Real quick, Dr. Schmidt was one of my attendings when I was doing my cytology fellowship down in Atlanta at Emory. And she's now a senior associate consultant and assistant professor at the Mayo Clinic, Arizona. The title of her talk is Intraoperative Consultation, Tips and Tricks for Successful Outcomes. So with that short introduction, I will pass the microphone over to Dr. Schmidt. Oh, hello everyone from all over the world. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks Emilio and thanks Rifat for inviting me. And I'm excited to share some tips and tricks on frozen with you. So a very long time ago, I was a surgical pathology fellow over in, in Rochester, Minnesota. And over there, they're really, really busy with frozen sections. And that gave me a highly valuable skill early on in my career. And because I had that skill, I had so many opportunities that I would not have had otherwise. And I highly recommend all of you learn frozen sections. It's gonna be worth it. And uh, with that skill, you're gonna be able to be active in your career, hopefully for a really long time. And this is how I feel about frozen sections, basically. By doing frozen sections, I feel like I can help my colleagues, I can help patients and help the surgeons. And that makes me just overall just happier about my job and not excited about it. And it's, it's really has been a good experience for me. So I wanted to point out to you that uh, doing a good job on frozen is not only about lo looking at slides and knowing what's on the slide. You need to put all the pieces together of this puzzle. You need to look up the clinical impression. What does the clinical team think it's going to be? Uh, what were the previous pathology diagnoses? Is, is there imaging available? Where is the mass? How big is it? How is it behaving? Is it behaving like a malignancy? Is it growing fast? Is it infiltrated? Is there any history of prior treatment? Is there any other remote malignancy you should be aware of, of, about? And also, if you see that the diagnosis is something somewhat exotic or something you're not very familiar and you think could be hard to detect on frozen, if possible, go ahead and pull those slides and have them available for you in case you would like to compare with your frozen section slides. So I like to say that the clinical history is like a safety net. Doesn't matter where in the world you are, where you're from, it's like your compass. Uh, I'm, and by knowing the clinical history, you can detect errors and, and just like realize when something is not making sense. I'm from the very far south part of Brazil, it's somewhat like middle of nowhere, cowboy land. And the people from the far south will tell you that without clinical history, you'll be more lost than a stray dog in a hail of gunfire. So I really hope you remember that. So in my talk, I will cover the top three reasons for a frozen section request. And I'll show 10 common challenges with the most common cause of pitfalls. And as we move along, I'll give you just general advices for better outcomes on frozen sections. So these are the top uh, most common reasons for intraoperative consultation, uh, margin evaluation, lymph nodes, and diagnosis. And very common that you have a mix of all of the above in the same case. And we'll start with the evaluation of margins. So in order to do a good job, you need to communicate very well with the surgeon and make sure he orients the specimen for you and that you both agree on the orientation. And I highly recommend that you keep the designation that he provides to you, the, like the anatomic landmarks, and don't switch, for example, uh, superior or medial mucosa for right or left or, you know, things like that just can make the whole process more complicated than it needs to be and can create challenges in the communication. And of course, you should document everything, write everything down, how big is the specimen, where is the tumor, and the size of the tumor in this from all margins document. You know, when you take your margins, it's shaved or perpendicular. And uh, shaved margins, they should be embedded, uh, the true margin facing up on the chuck. And then you know that you, if you have tumor on the slide, it doesn't matter where on the slide, it does not need to be touching ink, it's going to be a positive margin. 
Now, a limitation regarding shave margins is that, let's say, the margin is negative. It's going to be hard for you to determine, if you didn't do a good job with the growth, how far the tumor is from the margin. So we'll start with the case number one. This is a 58-year-old female, and she had a prior history of multiple invasive squamous cell carcinomas of the oral cavity. She also has multifocal high-grade dysplasia, and now she has a biopsy-proven hard palate lesion. So when you read this history, you know that because of this history of multifocal high-grade dysplasia, even if you have high-grade dysplasia on one of your margins, that's not going to be the main focus in, on this case. The main focus will be to clear the margins from invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So this is your specimen here. It came just like this, nicely oriented by the surgeon. And my best advice for you is that you need to do a good job with the growth. Try to identify where the tumor is. Let's say in this case, you can't see very well, palp palpate the specimen, and try to feel where, where do you think the closest margin is going to be. And when you take your margins, the best approach is that you take the margins off the specimen. Now, several centers, sometimes they take uh, separate margins from the tumor bed. That's really not the best way to evaluate margins because sometimes it's hard to match a positive margin to where in the specimen it could correspond. So really the best thing to do is take your margins off the specimen and go from there. So this is a copy of our worksheet and you can see here that there is a space on the right where you can draw or you can take a picture and print out you know, your specimen and you can document exactly where you're taking your margins. And there's also a space for you know, the patient information, document overall size, tumor size, distance to all margins. And if you're going to ink different colors, let's say green, medium, black, posterior, write everything down, what the ink corresponds to. And I hear where you know, you're taking your margin, so is it a shave, is it a perpendicular, what does the margin mean? Because when you start getting your slides, if you have everything documented like, like this, it's going to be way easier for you to report the findings to the surgeon and you don't, don't need to go back to the specimen and see where the margin was taken from. So this is something we do at our institution. After we take the first section for the HNE stain, you can see here the automatic stain that is staining for the HNE. We take an additional section and we stain with tall blue. And that is ready really, really fast, like less than a minute. So before I get my, my margin with the HNE, I have the tall blue margin to look at. And I can show you how it looks like. So this is a margin with the tall blue. You can see the tall blue, it's very good to look at architecture and you see this downward proliferation, proliferating nests are very worried so that this is a positive margin. So we are still waiting for our HE and we already know that this margin is extremely worrisome. And this here on the right side, you see the HE, you can see that you see the nuclear detail a lot better than in the tall blue. So as a general rule, I tend to wait for my HE and you know make sure I, I still think it's malignant. And you see these nests are very regular, proliferating downwards, but the cells, they look very well differentiated. So maybe you could be worried and kind of start doubting yourself and think, oh, could, it be, could this be hyperplasia? Is it really malignant? So for that, is that why is it so good to know about the prior biopsy? So you have your prior biopsy here on the right. And when you compare with your tumor, you see the prior biopsy, the tumor was we very well differentiated. They had this lymphocytic infiltrate in the stroma. And we can see that this margin really looks a lot like this prior biopsy. So th this indeed was a positive margin. So now what happens next is that the surgeon went ahead and revised that margin. So he sent you a tiny strip of mucosa like this. And he has previously inked it for you the true margin he inked black. But when that happens, I highly recommend that you go ahead and re-ink that margin ink by the surgeon. And the reason for that is that sometimes the ink used by the surgeon can wash away with processing. So this margin you're going to embed facing up. And so this is how you're going to evaluate now. When you embed that margin, you need to make sure that the tissue on the slide corresponds to the tissue on the chuck. The margin was bisected, so the, the number of fragments need to be the same, and the, two, the tissue size needs to be very similar. So when that happens, you know, let's say, 
if it turns out you and your margin is negative on frozen, but you have tumor on permanence, you know that that margin that was close but not positive, okay? And the true margin was evaluated at the frozen session. But let's say that on permanence, you have tumor on skeletal muscle, and here on the frozen, all you have is superficial mucosa, then you know you probably, that, that tissue was not cut deep enough into the block, and then you had a false negative margin on, on frozen and a true margin on permanence. So we'll now move on to case number two. This is a 68-year-old male with invasive high-grade erythelial carcinoma of the bladder. So I like to tell you that it's always good to predict what's going to happen. So when you read this history, you know you'll probably be getting ureter margins and sometimes urethral margins. So here it comes. This is your first ureter margin on frozen. And when you look at this low power, you see here the lumen looks you know, somewhat flat and okay. There is something in the wall somewhat proliferating downwards and we are going to take a closer look. So this is a closer look at the lumen. The cells look very bland, so there is no carcinoma inside the lumen. And we are going to look at the wall. So you see this very incised nest. They, they have abundant cytoplasm. The cells are very uniform. So not, you know, not very obviously malignant or anything. And again, a closer look, low NC ratio. So what do you think this margin is? Well, in the ureter, you can have flooded foam brune nest hyperplasia, okay? And this is how flooded foam brune nest hyperplasia looks like. When you compare with your margin, it does look somewhat similar. So maybe that could be the case. Now, this is the HE. Look at those nests. They are abutting muscle, kind of admixed with muscle. And that is a very red flag for you you actually, you need to know more, okay? So the, the biopsy was not only called invasive high-grade erythelial carcinoma. There was a very large comment stating that there were multiple patterns, including micropapillary and the nested variant. Now, what does that mean for you? So what it means that the nested variant can look a lot like flooded from the nest hyperplasia. It, the nests look very bland. And the only way to tell these two apart is that if you look at the base, okay, with flooded from the nest, the, ba the base is not infiltrated. It's very, you see, linear, very linear. Not, the nests are not going downwards. And now look at this nested variant of urothelial carcinoma. You have a nest under the muscle. So it's actually, there's muscle invasion. So that is basically the only way to tell this two apart. You need to look at the base. It's a, an extremely challenging diagnosis to diagnose this nest as very especially superficial biopsies and, so, and all frozen, and especially if you don't know about it, that the patient had this nest variant. So you make, make sure you read all the comments and know what it means. And as you move along, you know, in your pathology studies, make sure you know all the rare variants of malignancies that can limit benign because one day they can show up you know, in a frozen section. Other challenges that are a little bit more common than that uh, when you're evaluating urothelial margins is that let's say you, you can have malignant cells creeping around the fat in the outside of the urothelial margin, okay? And they can be really sneaky and you can really miss them. Or you can have malignant cells invading the muscular wall. And this here look like they might be even inside the lymphatic space. So make sure you not only look at the lumen, look at the wall, and look at the outside. Other common challenges, when you have a denuded mucosa, okay, make sure you cut deeper levels. This is the deeper level of this. this there was CIS here. You see the very pleomorphic looking cells, very disorganized, loss of polarity. So cutting deeper levels is a must when you have a denuded mucosa. Uh, sometimes benign urothelial mucosa can make you a little bit worried and nervous. It could be malignant because it can look a little reactive. The cells can look a little larger. So if you're not sure, find lymphocytes are in the stroma and compare this nuclear sites with the lymphocytes. So the benign urothelial cells, they shouldn't be bigger, let's say, not more than two times than a lymphocyte. And they, they still, they maintain polarity, they're maturing towards the surface. And when you compare with the CIS, the malignant cells here, they're, let's say, five 
times bigger than the lymphocytes. They're very pleomorphic, hyperchromatic, and you don't necessarily need full thickness invasion, I'm sorry, involvement by CIS. You can have pagetoid involvement. Look at this, and this can be extremely difficult on frozen. But again, the trick is to compare with the lymphocytes. All right, so we are now going to discuss case number three. This is a 58-year-old male, and he was diagnosed several months ago with a borderline resectable pancreatic head adenocarcinoma. So what does that mean? That he needed a ton of chemo and radiation in order to make sure that tumor was going to be surgically resectable. So then the WIPO was scheduled. And this is what happened. So the surgeon, before starting the WIPO, he inspected the peritoneal cavity, and he saw a suspicious hepatic nodule, okay, and he sends that to you for frozen section. So you see this proliferation of ducts here in the liver, but I want to point out to you that this proliferation is very well circumscribed. It's not invading to adjacent liver. These ducts, they are very, uh, uniform space from each other. The cells are bland, have single layer. So what this, this means is that this is probably not metastasis. This is something benign. This is bio duct adenoma. And, and again, a very good clue for you is that realize on low power that the, the lesion is circumscribed and the, you know, the ducts are bland and you have fibrostroma between these ducts. When you compare here with adenocarcinoma, you have more angulated glands, you have more uh, desmoplastic looking stroma. You can also have a bioductamartoma, and then you have some proteinations or bioduct in the lumen, and that's a good clue for you. Now, the pitfalls here are sometimes, not, not sometimes, many times it can happen that these lesions, they can look worrisome to the surgeon. They can be multiple, and they're usually small, but they can be large. They can be up to, let's say, four centimeters. But and also another trick for you is when you look under the microscope, these lesions, they can have brisk mitotic activity. So you really have to, you know, start focus on the low power and then evaluate that, you know, the cells are actually bland and the stroma in between is fibrous and go from there. Okay, so the surgeon went ahead with the Whipple and this is your pancreas, head, uh, pancreas neck margin. So you can see here from the low power that there is nothing normal here. This entire margin looks very abnormal, very fibrotic. And you do have a few, you know, nerves and there are some cauterized ducts here and there, but this architecture is, is really like not normal. So you look close, you see those cauterized ducts. Here it really looks like to me they're impinging on a nerve. But because there is so much cautery artifact, it's really hard to say what they are. And you look around a little bit more, you find some that are a little bit better preserved. You can say, oh yeah, there is definitely cytologic ETP and maybe some necrosis. So this margin was called positive. Now, how can you tell a positive margin from chronic pancreatitis? So again, on frozen sections, it's extremely important that you evaluate the low power. And on the low power, the architecture was not normal. And when you compare with chronic pancreatitis, the, you have preserved lobular architecture. It's almost like you can draw a circle around these ducts. And you look closer, the cells are very uniform, very bland. And you compare with this, even though this is cauterized, this messed up architecture on the low power is a, a very good clue for you. And again, and also when you have pancreatic adenocarcinoma, it's very rare that you don't have perineural invasion. So look, look for nerves and try to see if you see any perineural invasion, and that's going to be very helpful for you. So like I was saying, very important clue is the half phaser ducts. And sometimes the cytologic features like the nuclear hyperchromasia and mitosis and variation size, that can be really hard on frozen. Of course, on the HNE, it becomes super obvious. This is the HNE of the MRG, you see necrosis in the lumen and a ton of pleomorphism. But on the frozen section, things are not like that. So you, you really need to use the low power. Uh, and of course, if you find perineuro, that's great, but you might not find it. Another very helpful clue that I find is that if you find glands close to muscular vessels, that is a clue that that's probably malignant. Or if you find glands 
in muscle without stroma. So those are good clues for you, even though sometimes you can't evaluate the, the cytology very well. Other things you could do if you see suspicious cells at the margin, cut deeper levels into the block, okay? That can help. And also, if you already have the specimen, try to cut benchmark frozen sections off the main tumor and compare the cells of the main tumor with your frozen, with your typical cells on the frozen. These are sections of the main tumor, but there is a limitation here. This tumor is post-treatment, so it was very hypocellular, and out of like 15 blocks, only one or two of them had rare, rare malignant viable cells. So in this case, in the setting of post-treatment, this trick would not have helped you that much. So other pitfalls you should be aware of. The surgeon will respect the abdominal cavity and he might find enlarged lymph nodes. So let's say a woman can have endometriosis inside the lymph nodes. So you should be careful not to overcall that malignancy because if you do, the surgeon will stop the surgery. But you have to remember how the original tumor looked like. The cells are pleomorphic and you see here the cells are very uniform. Also, endosalpingiosis is tricky because, you know, the low part, this looks like a gland, but look close and you see the cells are very bland. Another tricky thing that can happen is endosalpingiosis can rarely happen in men, so it's just good to be aware of this. And also, especially in the post-treatment setting, you might, be, you might have a lymph node that is entirely replaced by mucin, that, you know, that tumor is probably dead and all you have left behind is mucin. And if that happens, you should report that as, you know, mucin only, no viable tumor. And if you have mucin only, that is not an indication to stop the surgery. So you should look at it very carefully, make sure there are no viable tumor cells. And some, you know, tricky uh, structures that you can find are vessels, okay? Because they can look a little, the cells can look plump and enlarged and a little atypical, and you might be thinking, could that be a gland? But, you know, make sure you don't overcall vessels as malignancy. So case number four, this is a 65-year-old male, and he has fully differentiated gastric adenocarcinoma. This gentleman also had history of prior abdominal surgery, and today he was scheduled for gastrectomy. But again, before the surgeon went ahead with the gastrectomy, he inspected the abdominal wall, and he saw some abnormalities. So he sent that for frozen, and this is how it looks like for you. So you see here, you have the skeletal muscle that is fibrotic and is diffusely infiltrated by these cells that could be either histiocytes or malignant cells. And there are, there are lots of sprinkled, you know, lymphoid-looking lymphoid cells in the background. And this can be really, really hard on frozen. Now what you're gonna do, so you look close and you see that some of these cells, they are making files and they have atypia and some prominent nucleoli here and there and irregular nuclear outlines. Some of them have mucin. So by this time, you should be really worried that this is probably malignant. And this is your H&E. You see how much easier things look on the H&E. These are obviously signal ring cells. So on the H&E, everything is so obvious. So how can you tell fully differentiated carcinoma from histiocytes on frozen? So when you compare with histiocytes here on your right, you see that histiocytes many times on frozen, they can look a little atypical, a little enlarged and a little hyperchromatic, but overall they have very uniform chromatin, uh, regular outlines, they're mostly round to oval and compared with tumor cells, the tumor cells, they vary a lot. You see, everybody's different from their neighbor. They're all, you know, different size and shapes, different chromations, they're irregular outlines. So th these are very good clues for you. And I have a few more pictures. So again, anisonucleosis, irregular nuclear contours, prominent nucleoli, you know, compared to histiocytes, the nuclear much more bland looking. Gland formation, that is a very good tip, okay? But sometimes you don't have it, then what do you do? So again, find a few lymphocytes in the background and compare the nuclear size. You see the malignant cells, this one is like four to five times bigger than a lymphocyte. And look at those, these histiocytes, they're mostly very uniform and they're not you know, bigger than two times the, the adjacent lymphocytes. 
So this is a table here to summarize the findings comparing you know, inf inflammatory cells and histiocytes to fully differentiate the carcinoma. So the only two absolute features that you tell you that you have carcinoma is when you have perineural invasion and you have focal gland formation. And all those other features I mentioned to you, they can all happen with histiocytes. However, they are very uncommon. And the minute you start to see several of them at the same time, then you know you probably have carcinoma and not histiocytes. So this is a few more you know, uh, uh, mimickers of malignancy that you can find on a margin. Ganglion cells, they may impinge on a nerve and they might look like malignancy. Endothelial cells might look like a gland. But my clue here is that find an endothelial uh, structure that you know is benign. Look at this guy and compare with the one you think might be malignant. And when you compare, you can see that they look very similar. Another clue is that look at the lumen and you find, if you find red blood cells, that's a clue for you that that's probably an endothelial uh, cell. We discussed foamy macrophages, small capillaries can be tricky. But again, if you find red blood cells in the lumen, that's very helpful. So this is another tricky situation when you, when you have this challenge of differentiating histiocytes from xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis from renal cell cancer. Why is this so hard? Because renal cell cancer has, the cells have low in ratio and they don't look flat out malignant or frozen. So what are the clues that can really help you? Well, renal cell cancer is normally highly vascularized when you compare Here with this, you have a lot more mixed inflammatory infiltrate admixed with the histiocytes. You might have granulomas, you might have necrosis, you know, and those are not features that are very commonly seen with renal cell carcinoma. Another clue I would like to share with you is that uh, take a section and stain with all blue stain. If you find this vacuolation of varying sizes in the cytoplasm, that indicates lipid content, and you don't see that with, normally with histiocytes, but you see that very common with renal cell cancer. So that is another clue to favor renal cell cancer over benign lesion. So just to highlight for you how, how hard it is to detect cancer after treatment, all the cells you see in this field, they are all malignant, and they really look like histiocytes, not so much like squamous cancer, but this is squamous cancer after radiotherapy. And I have the HME here for you. You know, of course, on the HME, everything is so much easier to identify this. You know, the nuclear uh, features are just so, so much better on the HME. And even adenocarcinoma can look like histiocytes. This is metastatic lung adenocarcinoma status post chemo. You see, they don't look like adenocarcinoma at all, but again, on the HNE, you see there is a lot more nuclear uh, outline irregularity and hyperchromasia. And let's say, if you still don't believe me, I show you the stains that these are really malignant cells with positive keratin, positive TPI point. Okay, so we are now going to move on to the second most common cause for a frozen section request, and that is the evaluation of lymph nodes. So when you have a lymph node for frozen section, the first thing you need to do is, why is this frozen section being requested? Is this for cancer stage or is this for lymphadenopathy of unknown etiology? And why do you need to know that immediately? Because if it is for cancer stage, you need to freeze the entire lymph node and look for metastasis. But if it is for lymphadenopathy, unknown etiology, you should not freeze the entire lymph node. You, you could consider making a smear, and if you see granulomas, you might not even freeze it, and you can tell the surgeon you see granulomas and tell him to like send some for culture. But if you want to freeze, just freeze just one section, okay? And then look at that section. If that one section looks normal, then you freeze the rest. And if the rest also looks normal, you tell that to the surgeon, tell them you have a lymph node that you know, looks morphologically normal and it could be non-lesional. So if he's looking for a PET positive lymph node that was detected on you know, imaging or if he's worried about lymphoma, he should try and you know, look for more lymph nodes and send more lymph nodes for you. 
Now, if that one section looks abnormal, don't freeze the rest. You save unfrozen tissue for permanence and additional studies. If you're, and you re, if you're not sure what is it, if you're worried it's lymphoma, you report that lesional tissue was obtained and this tissue is suspicious for lymph, lymphoproliferative disorder and you, you need special studies in order to be able to say for sure whether it, it's lymphoma or not and should send some fresh tissue for flow and you know, some unfrozen tissue for permanence. So we move on our case number five. We are halfway through my presentation. This is a 55 year old woman with breast cancer. So I give you this history and you know what's gonna happen. Of course, sentinel lymph nodes will be sent for evaluation. So this is your first sentinel lymph node. This is a low power view of your lymph node. Although you don't see any distinct nodule, you, you have a feeling something is wrong, like this architecture is not really normal. There are a few, you know, benign follicles over here, but I don't see follicles anymore. I don't see sinusoidal spaces. So, you know, this is a little bit weird. And could this be uh, something in form or I don't know what? So this is a higher power view of the, those areas that the architecture looks abnormal. And you look at the cells, they're very uniform, they're small. So what could this be? So before you say anything, you should know more about what is going on. You should know what kind of breast cancer are we talking about? Were those lymph nodes enlarged? Were they worrisome by imaging? Okay, so you should know this. Here we go. So it's invasive lobular carcinoma. The minute you hear that, that's how your face looks like because you know at one point in your career, it doesn't matter how good at looking at frozen sections you are, you know you're going to mess that one up because metastatic load is so hard to detect on frozen. So we have the total three lymph nodes and they're all called negative for carcinoma. So when you compare your lymph node with a lymph node involved by CLL, you can see they look somewhat similar because they both have, you know, abnormal architecture. How However, you got that node non permanent. Of course, you're going to do a keratin and look at this. There are two more cells wall to wall. They're just rare, you know, uh, spots where, you know, we saw the lymphoid follicles that were keratin negative. So, how can you detect that on frozen? So, we are going to zoom in on this spot right here where you can see the normal lymphoid follicle with this abnormal looking area, okay? And I'll show you a higher power. So here on the right side, you see this abnormal looking area. The cells, they have the same size as the cells, the lymphoid cells, almost the same size, maybe a little bit larger, not by much. They are just a little bit more atypical, but again, not much. And there is a hint of cohesiveness that is not so easy to pick up. If you get really lucky and you find vacuoles in the cytoplasm, that would be a really good clue you're probably dealing with lobular cancer. But again, this is not easy and it's a real pitfall on frozen sections. So, you know, these tumors that shed single cells as metastasis, like lobular cancer or signal ring, uh, melanoma, they can be very hard to detect on frozen. And also we are, we are very used to just focusing on the subcapsular space on frozen and looking for mats over there. And that is true, you know, most times the mats are going to be there, but not always. So don't forget to like pay attention to the overall leaf on the architecture and like look in the center. Sometimes you can have mass hiding in the center of the leaf on the Other clues for you, of course, prior treatment because the tumor cells are going to resemble histiocytes and be sparsely distributed. Compared to histiocytes, histiocytes have, you know, also very abundant cytoplasm, but if you find some hint of pigment and very round nucleus that favors histiocytes. But again, this can be very tough. So we are gonna move on to our third most common cause of a request for frozen section. We have the diagnosis. So that can be subdivided. Is this being done to obtain diagnostic tissue or is this being done to guide the extent of surgical resection? And you should know which one of these, these two you're dealing with. So figure out, okay, why is the frozen being performed? How much do you need to tell the surgeon at the frozen section bench, okay? 
And you, you need to know what will he or she do with that information. Is he going to stage the patient? Is he going to perform more radical excision? This is very important, especially in this setting of the radical excision that if you're not very sure, you, you, you need to you know, communicate that to the surgeon that you, you don't, you're not very sure of the diagnosis. So what about cases in which that a specific diagnosis cannot be determined? What do you do? So in those cases, try first to determine, do you have lesional tissue? Is it, or do, you don't have lesional tissue? If you think you don't have lesional tissue, all you have is just some random fibrous tissue and clots, so go ahead and do levels on that block. And if you still think you do not have representative lesion, you tell that to the surgeon. You tell him, hey, you know, this tissue might not be representative of the mass that you see, and could you please send me more tissue for frozen? But however, if you do think you have lesional tissue, try to determine, is it neoplastic or no? If it's not neoplastic, okay, if it's granuloma or abscess, tell that to the surgeon, and he would probably want to send some, you know, material for culture. Now, if you think it's suspicious for a neoplasm, try to determine, is it low grade, is it high grade? And why is, it that, that, is that important? Because sometimes if you say it's high grade, the surgeon will perform a more radical excision, might take lymph nodes. And do you think it's metastasis? Because if it's metastasis, the surgeon might stop the surgery. Do you think it's suspicious for lymphoma? And if that's the case, it should probably defer for permanence after additional studies. So case six is a very com common cause of frozen section request. This is a 45-year-old woman, and she has hyperparathyroidism. The, uh, the clinical team was suspicious for a parathyroid adenoma. So here we go. This is your frozen section, and in the low part of view, you see that there are numerous follicles. There is no fat, and you look close. You know, these follicles are very bland. So this really looks like, you know, like a hypercellular parathyroid. So that's what the frozen section diagnosis was. However, TTH levels did not drop. So we know what that means. It means well, not a thyroid. So that feature I just showed you was actually a, fo a follicular lesion of the thyroid, okay? So parathyroid and thyroid on frozen, they can look very similar because parathyroid sometimes have secretions that can look like coiled. And thyroid has all these micro follicles that can look like a hypercellular parathyroid. So what do you do? How do you tell them apart? Well, potential the nuclear features, because with parathyroid, the cells are more uniform and they, they're uniformly hyperchromatic. Compared to thyroid, you have a little bit more variation in size and shapes and a little bit more variation on the chromasia, okay? So that's a good clue for you. You could also try a smear and you are gonna have micro follicles on both but it might be just a touch easier to, for you to evaluate nuclear features and you can see variation in size a little bit better if it's thyroid. Now, I have another clue for you. You could try and polarize the tissue because if you do find crystals, that is going to favor thyroid tissue. Uh, you should not find tissue on parathyroid, but about 70% uh, of thyroid lesions, they have crystals. Now, the case I just showed to you did not have crystals, so it would not have been helpful on that case. So case seven, very common situation. You have a 50-year-old male, and he has a metastatic lymph node to the neck that you see over here that was P16 diffusely and strongly positive. And so... The primary site was occult, but when this happens, you know you could be dealing with the HPV-related lesion, and the surgeons, they will ask for frozen to look for the primary site, and they will focus on the oropharynx, because that's a common, uh, common spot to send metastasis to this uh, level two uh, lymph node and have HPV-related squamous cell cancer. So he goes ahead and he inspected, he inspected the uh, oropharynx and he finds that the tonsil is enlarged. And you can see here on the low power, the scripts are not normal. They are very distended, they're too big, and they have you know, abnormal architecture overall. It's almost you know, impinging downwards. And you look close 
look at this frozen section you know closer view you see that you have enough cytological pleomorphism to say yeah this is you know carcinoma and when you compare with normal tonsil on your right you see the cells of normal tonsil are very uniform very bland there is no pleomorphism but the challenge here is you have so many like sprinkled lymphocytes throughout that those lymphocytes can you know mask the tumor so you should really kind of look beyond the lymphocytes, try to look at the epithelial cells and determine if they are pleomorphic or not. So this is a different case. This is just a tonsil biopsy. This patient also had the metastatic P16 positive lymph node. So this case, the lesion is somewhat papillary and not obviously you know, invasive, but in a case like this that you know that there is a P16 positive lymph node, you should not report this as carcinoma in situ, just report as carcinoma present. Because in this setting, even though it might not look like it's invading, it might already you know, be metastatic. So in this setting, don't call anything in situ, call just positive for squamous carcinoma. Now that tumor had been incompletely excised and this is the re-excision, okay? And you can see that on the spot of the re-excision, the cells are somewhat hyperchromatic with high NC ratio. And you might be worried, is this you know, residual malignancy or what, what could this be? Is this just, is this just reactive? But when you, you, know, you look close, you realize that the cells are uniform. There is no pleomorphism. They are somewhat maturing towards the surface. And this is a different spot on the slide. You see this proliferation of squamous cells you know, nests in the stroma, and you look at this and you might feel worried, well, could this be invasive squamous cell carcinoma? So the clue here, look at the low power. You see how uh, very, this proliferation is very round, okay? Now look closer and compare to minor salivary gland tissue, you see this, this proliferation has about same size and shape of this nest of minor uh, salivary gland tissue. So you, then you realize, oh, okay, you know, this could be just, necrotizing cyalometaplasia. And you look close, there is no pleomorphism, the cells are very uniform, so probably not cancer. Now, if you still don't believe me, you get your permanent sections and you, you wanna do a P16, that proliferation is negative. This patch staining is not positive, this is considered negative. In order to become positive, it needs to be strongly diffused greater than 70% of the cells. Now, let's say that same patient had an enlarged neck lymph node with a nest that looks like this. Now, is this a metastasis or is this reactive or what's going on? It's really very eye-catching, okay? And you, you might be tempted to think this is a metastatic nest, but if you're not sure, find the lymphoid follicle, okay, nearby and compare the nest you're worried about and then them side by side. You see, they look very similar. The cells are very uniform, you know, overall very small. There's no pleomorphism. So this is just a reactive germinal center. Reactive germinal centers can be, they can be difficult because you can have a lot of mitosis and you can have random and large, you know, uh, lymphoid cells but you're not gonna have cohesiveness. Compared here with uh, squamous cancer, the cells are more cohesive and there is a greater degree of pleomorphism compared to the germinal center. Okay, so we are reaching towards the end of my presentation. This is case number eight, another head and neck cancer. So this is a um, head and neck case. This is a 61 year old male. He has bilateral nasal obstruction for 12 weeks. And the clinical team went ahead and performed a CT. They see a mass that they're very worried it's a malignancy that they think is a primary. So what happens, the patient goes you know, to the surgery and they are gonna try to resect the mass, but they first sent you this biopsy. So you can see here from the low power, there is no normal structures here. The entire mucosa is replaced by this proliferation of cells and you have like necrosis on the surface and you look close, you know, those cells are very pleomorphic, prominent nucleoli, you know, some good amount of cytoplasm here, there's some, you know, hint of plasmacytoid or rhabdoid, you know, hard to say exactly what these cells are. So the surgeon is, you know, calling you and asking you, what is it? You know, I, I want to go ahead and proceed with a uh, complete resection and I want to clear the margins, you know, we are at this, 
a difficult time of COVID and I want to get everything done at all at the same time. I don't want, I don't want the patient to come back for a second procedure. So you feel very stressed out and you really want to help and you want to say something, you know, and you know it's malignant, but the best thing for you to do right now is just chill out, stop, and think about your differential diagnosis. So you, you realize here your differential diagnosis is broad, and of course, the most common lesion in this spot is a squamous cancer. Then you can have other, you know, rare cancers that can look plasma cytoid and a little discohesive, and you can have melanoma, and you can have, you know, sarcoma, you can have rhabdomyosarcoma. And although most of these lesions, the, the you know, uh, curative treatment is surgery, not all of them need surgery for cure, okay? You can never, ever, ever forget to consider lymphoma, okay? And that is a very significant pitfall. So if you do not know what is it, at least consider it could be lymphoma. Now look at those tumor cells closer. Yeah, they look malignant, very pleomorphic, but could it be lymphoma? Of course, it could be lymphoma. So if you realize that, you're going to tell the surgeon, hey, you know, we have a poorly differentiated neoplasm. There is the possibility this could be lymphoma, and I'm going to have to defer the diagnosis for the permanence. And that's the best thing you can do. Save some unfrozen tissue, or send some for flow and for permanent slides. And here we go. So this was indeed lymphoma. It was NKT cell lymphoma. You see here, beautiful EBV inside hybridization. So by, by now you're like very relieved because disaster has been adverted. Had you called that, you know, poorly differentiated carcinoma, the, the patient would have had a radical resection that he did not need. Now you should please remember this, that extra nodal lymphoma on frozen can mimic carcinoma. So if you're not 100% sure what is it, consider lymphoma. Okay, so case number nine is a very common type of case. This is a 60-year-old woman with a uterine mass. She did have prior biopsies, but the material was scanned and the diagnosis on those biopsies was just, you know, atypical glands. So she's scheduled today for a hysterectomy, but the surgeon doesn't really know that she has cancer or not, what kind of, if it's cancer, then what kind. So what happened in this case is that the surgeon sent you some biopsies of that mass. And you look at this biopsy low power. First thing you need to determine, of course, is this carcinoma or not? And it, this is obviously carcinoma. There is no stroma here. The, the glands have a confluent proliferation and you know, maze-like and papillary and back-to-back -back glands. So we are 100% sure it is carcinoma. So now the next question is you should be able to answer is this low grade or high grade? And why is that important? Because if it is high grade, let's say high grade serous or clear cell or a grade three endometrioid, the patient will need a more radical resection. You might need omentectomy and pelvic lymph node dissection and the surgeon might need to inspect you know, a peritoneal cavity. So you should look close and try to determine is this low grade, high grade, and you see this cells have like columnar shapes and you have a little squamous metaplasia, very well-formed lens. So by now you're thinking that this is just, you know, endometrioid carcinoma, probably just a FIGO1. So how can you be sure it's not serous carcinoma? On the low power, serous carcinoma sometimes can also have this glandular configuration. And it might look like on the low power, you're dealing with a FIGO1 adenocarcinoma. And also the papillary structures, they're not specific for serous. They can easily happen on endometrioid. So what you should do, you should always take a look at higher power, okay? Because in serous carcinoma, you have a lot more cytologic atyp. You see pleomorphies. The cells are varying like four times bigger than the neighbors. You know, a lot more marked pleomorphies. And you compare that to endometrioid. Yeah, these glands are malignant, the cells are, have high incidence ratio, but they're not varying in size and shapes in a way like serous carcinoma would. And there's even some hint of squamous differentiation that again, that favors endometrioid, but you don't always have that. So we determined this is a low-grade endometrioid adenocarcinoma, and what's gonna happen now is that you're gonna have your hysterectomy, 
and everybody knows that in this situation, you're supposed to assess the depth of my nutrient patient. But you should not forget that that's not your only job, okay? You need to inspect this uh, hysterectomy grossly. And the first thing that jumps at you, you see how this cervix is massively enlarged. And you should also look around, look at the peritoneal surface, look at the ovaries and fallopian tubes. So to me, the, the ovaries didn't look normal. They look slightly granular and a little enlarged. So, you, you know, now we are going to head and we'll start, you know, examining this patient. We are going to ink, you know, the margins. We are going to open these uterus along the lateral sides. And we found the cancer. It was centered in the lower uterine segment. And it was invading less than 50% of the myometrial wall. But that's not your only job. You also need to assess the extent of invasion. This tumor is invading into the cervix. There is lymphovascular space invasion. So this is already T2, okay? And what else is going on? The ovaries, the bilateral ovaries, they were abnormal. You see the surface is granular. Uh, there is like a one to two CM, you know, lesion involving the ovaries. And when you look at the frozen, you see the, the tumor, there is tumor in the ovaries that look like the tumor in endometrium. So now what do you do with that information? You need to determine, are those primary ovary tumors or are those metastases? What, what favors metastases in our case is that the ovarian masses were small, they were bilateral, you had ovarian surface invade, involvement and you know, multinodular. Now, can you have synchronous ovaries and ovarian and endometrial tumor? Of course you can, but again, what favors metastasis, the bilateral ovarian involvement, lymphovascular space invasion, multinodular growth. Although we didn't have myometrial invasion, we had so many other features that we felt comfortable. This is probably metastasis. We also we did not see any, any endometriosis, so this is probably metastasis. So having that information, we should tell that to the surgeon. And although it was just a FIGO-1, invading less than 50% of the myometrium, the surgeon went ahead, he took the pelvic lymph nodes, he inspected the peritoneal cavity and made sure there were no other masses. Okay, so we reached our final case. This is a true case that you know, it happened to me my first weekend on call at the Mayo. And it's a classic, you know, Friday night slash holiday eve case. It's very, you know, uh, uh, urgent situation. You have a 48-year-old male, heavy smoker with a remote histomelanoma, and he presented with acute and progressive shortness of breath. So this patient is, is he's suffocating, and the clinical team realized he has a very large mediastinal mass, and they need to start start treatment immediately. And this patient is doing so poorly that they, they don't want to put him through anesthesia. So what happens is that they give you smears, okay? They didn't give you tissue. And these are the clinical, you know, differential diagnosis. Could it be carcinoma? Could it be lymphoma or melanoma or something else? So here are your smears now. So this is h and &E stain smears. You can see that you have two more cells that most of them are aggregating clusters and you look closer, you see that, you know, the cells that have high NC ratio, hyperchromatic chromatin, there is necrosis, there is a hint of molding here and there, there is a lot of crush artifact, and a lot of clustering, so, you know, we have this feeling that this is probably, we favor a carcinoma, and this type of chromatin is like the type of chromatin you can see with small cell, so if you compare with, you know, the other entities in the differential diagnosis, seminoma would have a lot more cytoplasm, vacuolate, the prominent nucleoli, and compared to small cell, you don't see uh, nucleoli in small cell. Melanoma, you have a lot, of, again, lots of single cells, intranuclear inclusions, binucleation, prominent nucleoli, lymphoma, you know, very pleomorphic single cells. Now, in my opinion, it can be really, really tough to differentiate small cell from a high-grade lymphoma because they can both crush a lot. And sometimes you have the feeling you have some, you know, small clusters and, and, it's, you know, it's, just, and it's lymphoma. What you should do, you should look close at the chromatin and compare, okay? Look at the chromatin of the lymphoma is different. It's more like blasty looking. The, compared to small cells, more hyperchromatic looking chromatin. 
But in a case like this, if you're not sure, all you can do is favor one of the other, and then the clinical team can decide if they want to start treatment or not, or wait for the stains. But this, you, you know, these cases sometimes happen in the middle of the weekend, and not everywhere you have the availability of technicians that can come and do immuno stains for you. So it is really important that you have this skill to be able to favor one of the other, you know, because in a situation that you can't wait and they need to start treatment, at least, you know, it can be helpful. So if you do happen to get a frozen section, and if you have a frozen section of, let's say, a lymphocyte, it can happen that you have so much crushed cells on a, lymph, on a lymph node that you might think, could this be metastatic small cell? And if you do call metastatic small cell to a lymph node, the surgeons, they will stop the surgery because that means this tumor is not operable anymore. So how can you tell this, these are just crushed lymphocytes and not small cell? So look around and you see how the cells around this crushed area, they're very small and uniform. And when you compare with small cell here on your left side, you see small cell, the cells are way bigger than lymphocytes. The chromatin is different. They're, you know, various size molding and lots of mitosis. So those are very good clues for you. So we have reached the end of my presentation and I just want to summarize with a few uh, uh, tips of how can we do a better uh, job on frozen section. So years before is your time to do frozen section. You can work on your cytology skills. Do smears while you're at frozen. Try to you know, at least be good at distinguish the broad basic uh, categories. Uh, learn how to grow. You know, in the US, we have PAs that help us out a lot. They are really competent and helpful, but you should know how to do it yourself. And you should be really good and fast at it because at frozen section, you don't have a whole lot of time and you need to be able to identify abnormal growth structures very fast. Now, on the day or day before a frozen, you need to focus on reducing your stress level. And you can do that by being better prepared. And what do I mean by being better prepared? Look up the history, pull the slides, know what's going on. And when you start getting frozen sections, you keep your bench organized. And if you get hit with a very high volume of cases, try to figure out what's the you know, most urgent. If you look at sentinel nodes first. And if you had so many slides from a, a, mar a, a margin that you need to evaluate, pick the closest uh, slides to the margin. Give the surgeon a call and explain you, you have multiple cases going on. His case might take a little longer and ask him if he's worried about a specific margin, you can look at that one first. And if you start feeling like it's too much and figure out if there is a way for you to call for backup. Now, uh, document everything you tell to the surgeon, everything you do with the specimen, if you're gonna send you know, material for flow. And extremely important is that you communicate with the surgeon as clear cut as possible. I recommend that you don't use too many words when you're communicating your, your, your results, especially over the phone. And if the case is weird, if it is going to require a conversation, go into the OR and talk face to face to the surgeon. If things don't make sense and if you have findings that don't match, go there and talk to him and try to find out what the additional findings during surgery that would explain your findings. Or let's say if you cannot tell him exactly what is it, you know, explain it to him why, preferably face to face if it's going to be a long conversation. So what about if you get a new job? Well, don't freak out, okay? If you get a new job, try to figure out what kind of specimens you'll be receiving. And this is kind of normal because sometimes in your residency, you have a higher volume of a certain kind of specimens and not so many, such higher volume in others. So try to figure out what are the most common types of specimens you're going to be receiving in your new job and pull, maybe pull some slides, talk to your colleagues, ask them for advice, find out what are specific requests by surgeon and specific expectations the surgeon might have. And that is extremely helpful. So what about if you get a difficult frozen and you can't tell what is it? So just to figure out how much is it that you need to tell the surgeon right now, okay? So that appropriate care will be delivered. 
it's in the act, it's in the oplast, low grade, high grade, metastasis, primary, could this be lymphoma? And if you can tell the furry for permanence is totally okay, but you do have to make sure you have lesional tissue. And if you're not sure you have lesional tissue, you should request more tissue. So at all times during frozen sections, you should always know, no matter what, what is the goal of this frozen section and what will the surgeon do with this information, okay? Is this frozen section being done for diagnosis? So make sure you obtain diagnostic tissue. And is the surgeon gonna act on your information? Is he gonna act on it today, okay? So that's crucial because if you're not sure, you should make sure you communicate that. That's all I have for you. And I have selected a few reference. And I know in my field with frozen sections, you, you're kind of like helpless and there's so many you know, unpredictable things that happen, but in many, many cases, that's not true. There are lots of resources available. You can prepare for it, you can read, you can try to find out what kind of specimens you'll be receiving. And if you hate frozen sessions, if, if you think it's so hard, you know, try to learn and, and turn that obstacle into an asset for you. And that can help you tremendous, tremendously throughout your career. That's all I have. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for this excellent presentation on frozen sections. I can see a few questions online. The first question is from Suva Lakshmi, who says that uh, she receives a lot of frozen section for post neoadjuvant chemotherapy breast lumps after wide local excision. And many a times the tumors are not shown up on frozen section, but they get it when they do permanent. So do you have any experience on those? And what is your suggestion? Like how many sections they should take uh, on such specimens? So I actually do because uh, here in Arizona, we get lots of those specimens for frozen. And what we do is that we do a very good job with the gross evaluation. So uh, look at the specimen grossly, identify the mass and try to see. So your goal here is not to detect viable tumor because you, you're probably gonna need to put several sections through to find viable tumor. Your goal is to make sure the margins are clear. So look at it grossly and try to figure out if the mar is there any margin that is worrisome to you. And if there is a closed margin, then just take a, a one or two sections of the closed margin and go from there. And if you know their margin is, you, you make do your frozen and you look at it under a microscope and it's all fibrotic, great. You know, you can report that you know there is no viable tumor at the margin. So my recommendation is just focus on clearing the margin and not making like a, a diagnosis of the mass. Uh, here's the next question. Uh, do you ever do immunohistochemistry during frozen section evaluation? We do not. No. Uh, the next question is about uh, Hirschsprung's disease. What is your experience of a frozen section for looking at ganglion cells in Hirschsprung's disease? So we don't have a whole lot of pediatric cases. And I, I actually saw those cases as a resident. And you know, after I finished training, I never saw those cases again. So I'm sorry, I cannot help you with that one because I haven't seen a case like that since I was a resident. Uh, here's the, another question from Nivea. So how do you assess dysplasia in head and neck cancers, especially after post-treatment? Yeah, so this is a very good question. So the first question you should ask yourself is, how important is it for you to assess dysplasia, okay? Is the surgeon going to act on it? Does the patient have a multifocal high-grade dysplasia? Because if that's the case, he might not even act on it. So try to focus on the, and if, okay, if you think he might act on it, try to focus on the term, is it low-grade or high-grade? So for high-grade dysplasia, I look for cytologic pleomorphy, so variation in cell sizes, okay? And, and that can be very helpful. And uh, a hint of this cohesiveness inside the epithelium is also very good clue. If you find mitosis, this keratosis, those are very good clues. Now, if you're not sure it's high-grade dysplasia, don't overcall it. 
you, and tell the surgeon, hey, hey, I think it's this plastic I cannot grade. And there is a limitation to frozen sections and they know it. And if you sure it's high grade, sure, call it high grade, he may or may not act on it. Right, uh, here is the next question about, uh, what is your experience about frozen sections on thyroid specimens? Do the, how far do you entertain them? And uh, what's your experience on that? Yeah, so we do sometimes do a frozen section of thyroid lesions. So uh, first of all, uh, do a good job with your growth. Look at it. Does it look like it's well circumscribed or not? Okay, if it's well circumscribed, uh, that's you know a very important thing you should uh, keep in mind because if it's not PTC, you're gonna need to submit the entire cap to for permanence. So if it's well circumscribed, I try to focus on determining is it PTC or not PTC, or not obviously PTC. So, and then I tell that to the surgeon. If I, if I see papillary destructions and I see the uh, cytologic features, I'm 100% sure I say, yeah, it's a papillary thyroid carcinoma and you know the lesion measures so and so and if it's under a certain size he might not do anything anyway and also if it's well circumscribed if he has nuclear features of ptc it can still be you know that newly uh, described lesion the, the nftp so that's a limitation so I always mention if it's well circumscribed or not but if you see papillary instructions then you know it's not nftp now, uh, an advice I have if you have thyroid lesions is make a smear and stain it with HME because that is much, much more helpful to you to evaluate the nuclear features than on the frozen section. Because with frozen section, you have so many artifacts on the nuclear features that is very hard. Now, let's say if your lesion is very infiltrative, that might make it, make it easier for you to, you know, to say this lesion is infiltrative and look for vascular evasion and and just describe to the surgeon what you see. Next, next question is about uh, frozen section for sentinel lymph nodes. And the question is, uh, how many levels do you actually examine? Is it more than two? Oh, sorry, more than three sometimes? What's your experience? So we only do two. We, we, we take a section for the HE &E and a section for the tall blue. So we serially section that sentinel lymph node perpendicular to the long axis, and we look at all the lymph node, but we only do two levels at frozen. And there's another question from Nivea. So in gastrectomy specimens post neoadjuvant, so how do you differentiate between ganglion cells from grade three tumor? So the ganglion cells, they have very abundant pink cytoplasm and the nucleus is very round, very, very round, okay? Compared to tumor, the nuclear, they have irregular outlines and they vary in size and shapes. Whereas in ganglion cells, those nuclei are gonna be round and uniform. You can have prominent nucleoli, but just the roundness of it is a clue for you. And Here's another question on thyroid. Uh, what's your take on poorly differentiated carcinoma and anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid on frozen section? So, you know, the anaplastic and poorly diff, they can be tough, you know, to tell on frozen, but you might not need to, to tell the surgeon that on frozen because especially if you have poorly differentiated, if you think it's poorly differentiated, that there are other tumors that could look like that, like medullary, okay? So the best for you is to tell the surgeon, hey, I think it's malignant. It could be this and it could be that, but I'm gonna need immunostains to you know, tell the two apart. And let's say if it's crazy ugly, like center on the thyroid and it looks like it could be an aplastic, again, you tell the surgeon, this is a very high grade looking tumor. It looks like it could be you know, an aplastic thyroid cancer. Very rare, there are other entities that can look like, you know, anaplastic, like angiosarcoma. So you, again, you're going, to, you're going to defer the final for permanence, but if the tumor is centered on the thyroid, you can favor anaplastic if it's very high grade looking. And here's another question from Anu that, what is your take on margins on frozen section? Do you do radial margins or shape margins? Which is better? So it depends. It depends on the case. It depends on the, the tumor, you know, how close it is to the margins. Uh, I think 
a good growth exam is number one, okay? Now, it depends on your institution. Some institutions, the surgeons, they, they are kind of very, you know, like demanding, they demand that you freeze all margins and, you know, you don't have that much say on it, but there are other institutions where you can see, you, you are only gonna freeze your closest margin. And let's say if you're very close to the margin, uh, you, you can take a shave, but then do perpendiculars off that strip. Just like on that picture I show in my case, I, I took a, a, a strip and then do perpendiculars because then you can still see the distance from margin when it's very close. And if that's something important that the surgeon needs to know. So it's kind of like you have to go case by case and it also is going to depend on your institution. One last question, I think. Uh, uh, what's your experience on seminomas for frozen section and what are the key features for diagnosis? Yeah, so seminoma can look a lot like lymphoma, okay? And most times you don't need to give like a definitive diagnosis and you, you just, if you can see how far it's from the margin, it's out and, you know, that kind of stuff. And if you do your smears, if you have uh, vacuoles in the cytoplasm, abundance vacuolated cytoplasm, that favors seminoma over lymphoma and lymphoma you have more, uh, the chromatin is different, is more like plasty looking and more crushed artifact, but that might be very difficult to distinguish on frozen and you might need to defer for permanence. And if you worry it could be lymphoma, save some tissue for flow cytometry. That's the best thing you can do on frozen is like, um, kind of uh, separating what, you, what are special, stu special studies you need to do and make sure you have the tissue to do whatever it is that you need to do. I think that's the end of the uh, QA session. And there are more questions. Uh, sorry that we won't be able to answer them all for uh, time constraints. And I hope uh, uh, some of the questions uh, you can send to us again and some Dr. Smith can also answer on Facebook. And if you send questions to us, so we would be happy to send them over to Dr. Smith again. And thank you, Dr. Smith, for this, for this excellent lecture on frozen section, which is so important all over the world that, uh, and we always face trouble uh, evaluating them. You would be so happy to hear that uh, we had several hundred viewers from all over the world and I could keep track of at least some countries. I would name a few like Bangladesh, Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, uh, Thailand, Italy, and of course uh, there were viewers from US and a lot of viewers from India also joined in. And thanks to our viewers for your support and uh, I would definitely request you to subscribe to our podcast YouTube channel and also like and follow our uh, Facebook page so that uh, you can stay updated with all the upcoming lectures. And we also have a newsletter. You can subscribe to that. That will also give you information about the upcoming lectures. And our next podcast lecture is next week. That is on August 25, 8 a.m. Eastern time. And that would be a lecture on GYN pathology. And uh, our speaker is Matt Quick from University of Alabama or cancer, sorry, and the topic is endometrial adenocarcinoma with challenging differentials. And thank you again, Dr. Smith, for your talk and for sharing your experience with us. We appreciate it very much. Thanks well, thank you so much for this opportunity and good luck everyone with your frozen sections. So let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.